Let us turn to Acts chapter 20. We're looking at Paul's reason to return to the title of the message. We could have entitled it, uh, Disciple the Few to Reach the Many, because that's really uh, Paul's uh, heart and what uh, we see him doing here. We left him last time in, uh, uh, in Ephesus. There had been the riot, uh, you remember, in the big amphitheater. We showed you uh, pictures of it. Uh, right now, with the archaeological remains exposed, it would see 25,000, but uh, uh, there's uh, reason to believe that in the first century it may have uh, seeded up to uh, 50,000, some archaeologists say, which would be the equivalent to the uh, seating at uh, Aloha Stadium. Uh, remember, it was a city clerk who quiets the crowd and so forth because he not only could lose his, uh, his own job because that riot was illegal under Roman law, but uh, he could have lost his uh, life as well. So he's able to quiet the crowd. And uh, again, some uh, uh, official Roman officials that had come to faith in Christ prevent Paul from going in where he wanted to, uh, of course, have the opportunity to preach the gospel. And so uh, he leaves Ephesus now like he leaves uh, a lot of cities uh, in the middle of the night before somebody gets a hold of him. Uh, and that's uh, one of the practical reasons for this particular uh, journey. Uh, the other one is to uh, preach at uh, Troas on his way to uh, Macedonia. Again, he's going to, and I'll show you on a map in a moment, but uh, he'll leave uh, what is Western Turkey and make his way up overland uh, and cross over what is today uh, uh, southern Bulgaria, uh, and then down into northern Greece, and then into southern Greece, getting to Corinth. He's hoping to meet uh, Tro uh, to meet uh, Titus at Troas. Titus has been out uh, uh, at Corinth uh, ministering. He's waiting to hear the report, how the church is doing. Uh, and of course, also, uh, they are collecting offerings. The uh, church back in Jerusalem in the first century, that part of the world went through a drought. Economic, uh, the economy was terrible. Uh, people that are coming to faith uh, uh, in uh, Jesus and Yeshua as their Messiah, uh, they are, of course, being uh, ostracized from their family, very often losing their job in the family business and so forth. So uh, they're hurting. So there's an offering being taken among these churches through Greece and, uh, and through uh, Western Turkey, the churches Paul have established to take back. And so uh, that's a purpose for the, uh, uh, the journey also. Uh, one more practical purpose, it was to say goodbye. Uh, Paul seems to anticipate that he will not see them again. We'll see him express that uh, uh, in our message next week to the believers, the elders that meet him on the beach there in Melita. So uh, five practical reasons for the journey, but I think the overriding purpose is so that he would have the opportunity to encourage believers uh, once again, and in particular, uh, new believers. Let me just, if, if in case this helps, again, uh, uh, right in the middle, you see, I don't know how good your vision is, but uh, I'm close and I can't read all of this, but uh, I can read Asia. So that's, uh, again, Western Turkey, uh, and, uh, and below that on the coast, following that red line is uh, Ephesus. Uh, he'll go north and up through uh, Macedonia and down through all the way to Achaia. Achaia is where uh, Corinth is. Uh, and then he'll reverse the process and go back. And we'll see he skips Ephesus uh, because he is in a hurry to get back to Jerusalem. He hopes in time for Pentecost. Uh, and so he uh, sails directly past Ephesus and on down to Miletus. Uh, and that will take us to our, our study next week where we'll have the Apostle Paul addressing Christian leaders, the only time we have it uh, anywhere in the book of Acts. We have uh, him debating and reasoning from the scriptures and the synagogues on many occasions. We have one sermon that he gives to unbelievers in Acts 17 on the area of Gapius or Mars Hill, and we have one message that he gives uh, to Christian leaders that uh, we'll look at next week. But let's look at the overriding reason for, for Paul uh, in this journey uh, we're seeing that in verses 1 to 6, it's to strengthen the <laughs> believers. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed there three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And uh, Sopadar and uh, Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus of, and uh, Secundus of Thessalonians, Gaius of Derby, Timothy, Tychicus, Trophimus of Asia, 
Uh, these men going ahead waited for us at Troas, but we <laughs> sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. So uh, in those verses are all of that traveling that we just looked at uh, on the map. But again, it's for the purpose of strengthening the, the believers. This was Paul's, uh, Paul's heart all along, to, uh, to disciple the few, to, uh, to reach the many. Uh, and, uh, and primarily he did that not in big public meetings. It was never Paul's desire to get to a church and have the biggest church in that town. See how many people he could attract to that. No, it was always to reach a few people and see those few people discipled in the Lord. And it was never done through a course, through a workbook, through a DVD set. It was, uh, it was a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. It was a lot of sitting down and having meals with two and three people uh, at, a, at a time. Uh, one writer said that uh, if you wanted to be discipled by the Apostle Paul, you better pack your bags because that's how it was done. You, uh, you jumped in with uh, the team that he had, the gang that traveled with him, uh, and that's how you got discipled. But that's certainly his heart. Uh, writing to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 11.38, He'll go through a, a litany of uh, his own uh, personal experiences and uh, abuse that, uh, that he went through for the gospel's sake. Uh, but then he'll say in the end what really is a concern on his heart. I think it's interesting. He says, I am more in labors, more abundant, uh, in stripes above measure, in prison more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 49, uh, 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and day I've been in the deep, in journeys often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, uh, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in toil, in sleep, uh, sleeplessness often, in hunger, in thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, in verse 28, besides the other things, besides those things he just mentioned, what's really on his heart, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. I've been through a lot of stuff. You know what really is, is, uh, is on my heart? I'm really concerned for those new believers and whether they're going to walk with the Lord or not. That's, that's the purpose of this, uh, this journey here. Uh, plan to make two visits to Corinth. Uh, instead, uh, it uh, turns into one that lasts three months. And it's during that time period, that three-month period that we're re reading about here in these couple of verses, that he writes a letter to the church at Rome, which uh, certainly lays out most of the theology of, uh, of the New Testament. Uh, Paul's concern, secondly, again, as uh, we've already said, to strengthen new believers. Uh, verse 1 says, Paul called to himself uh, the disciples to himself and it embraced them. Kind of uh, interesting. I'm not sure why they use that term uh, uh, a lot of versions, NIV and others, will say encourage. Uh, uh, we might translate the word counsel. It comes along to counsel them. It's translated, uh, this Greek word, exhort, comfort, counsel, challenge, uh, the exhort in a, in a positive uh, sense. It's used again in verse 2. Now, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, that's our same word. This is Paul. how Paul disciples. He meets with people one-on-one -on -one or small groups whether it's over a meal or walking down the road or however uh, he can squeeze it in. Timothy probably learned to sew up tents by, by now if he wanted to spend time uh, with, uh, with Paul. Uh, but it was uh, in these smaller settings that he, quote, uh, encouraged. Uh, we see it back in, uh, in Philippi in chapter 16, verse 40, after he's released from prison. So they went out of prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they'd seen the brethren, same word, they encouraged them and departed. So Paul's encouragement, his exhortation, uh, you know, it was constant. Uh, that was his heart. Disciple the few to reach the many. Uh, and that's the heart of God, certainly. We see that as he writes again to the church in Corinth in chapter 1, verse 3 of uh, 2 Corinthians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, in the God of all comfort, that's our word, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort uh, those who are, are in any trouble with the comfort with which ourselves are comforted by God. That's the heart of God. God comes along and wants to challenge, to exhort in a positive way, to encourage us. 
to embrace us uh, to himself, even in the midst of difficult situations and trials and so forth. And he does that so we'll learn then how to comfort, uh, how to encourage others that are going through those same kind of trials. And certainly Paul had his. Uh, he knew what it was to be comforted by God, and he knew how to comfort, we'd say, disciple others. It's his primary way of doing that. And Paul reveals, it, reveals his motivation for it uh, in using the same terminology in writing to the church here in Thessalonica when he says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, 4, our exhortation, that's our word, did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Down in verse 8, so affectionately longing for you, uh, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our lives. Why? Because you had become dear to us. That's his motivation. Why does he have this longing? Why is he making this trip? Because they had become dear to us. Verse 11, as you know how we exhorted, that's our word again, and comforted and charged every one of you, how? As a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom uh, and glory. So he reveals his motivation. Paul thinks of these new believers in these churches like a father to, uh, to their children. Uh, he wants to get back there. He goes, you know, I've been beat up an awful lot, but you know what's really on my heart? Uh, I need to get back to these new believers and make sure I can challenge them a little bit, encourage them, exhort them, come alongside them, counsel them. That's another uh, term. It's a similar Greek word uh, to the uh, word we translate Holy Spirit, the counselor, parakletos. It's a, uh, it's a similar kind of word. This is the, the heart of the Apostle Paul, the reason for the journey. Thirdly, Paul would often strengthen the believers uh, simply by the, the practical means of, well, literally, as we've said, being with them. Look at verse 4, again, a list of, uh, of men that are now traveling with him who represent certain areas, probably overseeing the collection of the offering now on its way to Jerusalem, but his team certainly is building. And uh, Sopater of Berea, accompanying him to Asia, <coughs> Turkey, that area. Also Aristarchus and Secundus of, Thess of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby. Uh, and Timothy and Pinticus and Trophimus of uh, Asia. So returning to Macedonia, he's got traveling companions listed with him. Uh, they go ahead to, uh, to Troas, uh, probably for the purpose of finishing the, the collection for the needy believers in Jerusalem. Uh, but again, uh, these men traveling uh, with them. Uh, there's uh, very, uh, very interesting that, again, this team agrees to rendezvous with them. They've got to separate because of the plots against uh, uh, Paul's life. This is not an easy thing for him making this journey. It's a dangerous trip for him. Uh, but Paul and Luke sail from Philippi, and they join the others at, uh, at Troas. Um, again, Paul very seldom uh, traveled alone. We see the one in our studies of Acts so far, we just saw the one little time when he departs and goes to Athens by himself, uh, again, because he kind of had to get out of town rather than, uh, uh, you know, be, be thrown back in jail, be beaten, be killed, or whatever. They, they get him out of town, but uh, he waits for the others to, uh, to join them, uh, and he was all about spending time with other people. It's good what we do. Uh, this is the primary way that people are discipled, certainly through the teaching of God's Word. Uh, but I just think about the, uh, uh, the times when uh, we have breakfast with the guys maybe after praying together or the men's retreats or uh, the other times, the conversations. Uh, it's uh, the small setting times that so much discipleship is done. Uh, we often say in very true that uh, discipleship is caught, it's not taught. I mean, you can teach, only teach so much, uh, but the primary way we learn is by watching and, and learning. I uh, had just the, uh, the thrill of maybe the fifth or sixth time in my life to uh, install a toilet again last week. I uh, always look forward to that. And, uh, <laughs> but you know, I've, you know, I've probably done more than six. I've probably done a dozen. Not bragging, but uh, I'm just saying. But hey, it's still, I, uh, I still go on YouTube and watch The Professional because it's like, I, okay, it's been a year, maybe two years since I've had to do this. I want to watch somebody do this again. It's like, okay, wait, 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 play that back again. Uh, it's like, wow, I never did that part before. You know, it's just like, it, it's more helpful to my brain to watch somebody uh, so I can learn as opposed to just read about it. I don't want to read about it online. I want to watch somebody actually uh, do it, especially when it's something uh, out of my realm, unfamiliar to me. 
Uh, and that's what Paul did here. Uh, he would come alongside these guys. Uh, he wouldn't drop off a how-to list, uh, how to follow Jesus in 10 easy steps. They would just watch him. He always makes those phrases, you saw me and how I lived. He, he lived uh, among them. Uh, he describes the method in 2 Timothy uh, 2, 2, when he says, and the things which you have heard from me uh, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The words uh, from me mean alongside of. Uh, and the things that you have heard me by being with me and seeing them in front of many witnesses, these are the things I want you to entrust to others. It's not things you read about or read about in a book or you heard other people say about me. It's the things you actually were with me uh, and you watched this. Take those things and teach them to others. Uh, some, uh, write, one writer said that there are four generations represented here of Christians. There's Paul, who discipled Timothy. Timothy, who's instructed to disciple anybody he can find. No, actually faithful men to be very careful who he's uh, spending time and energy pouring into. Uh, and then those are then to disciple others, four generations of believers. Uh, and it does make a difference. Again, we uh, quoted last week the idea, do not be deceived. You know, bad company corrupts good character, and it truly does. But the opposite is true as well. Proverbs 13, 20 says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools uh, will be destroyed. And then when I first uh, uh, came to the Lord and then, began uh, teaching a, a Bible study that uh, Danny Lehman somehow wrote me into uh, filling them for him on, on occasion, and then uh, he was foolish enough to leave and turn the thing over to me. And then, of course, half the people left, but, uh, which I don't blame them, but uh, uh, the couple who hosted it stayed since it was at their house. So we still had, we still had a, a, few, a few of us, and we continued on. And then, uh, and then Bill calls me and tells me, uh, Pastor Bill, uh, you need to come to the leadership meetings now because uh, you're a leader. Well, I, no, I'm just trying to help out Danny because he, you know. Anyway, he uh, basically says, uh, uh, gave me uh, an edict to, uh, to show up at his office on Saturdays at 8 o'clock, uh, which, uh, which I did. And then he says, oh, yeah, now that you're doing this, you, you need to go up front after the services uh, when people come up for prayer and pray for them. I'm, really, I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking if he really knew who I was, he wouldn't let me in the church. Must let, now he's putting me up front to pray for people. I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, but Danny's up there, and I know Danny knows what he's doing. And uh, so I would just go stand next to Danny. And Danny was, yeah, just stand right here. Because uh, uh, I was very honest. I don't know what I'm doing. Good, just stand right here. And, uh, and that's what I did. And I just listened and watched. And, uh, and Danny said, just do what I do. You know, what if I don't know their name? Pray for, call them brother and sister. <laughs> it's a good tip, by the way. Very practical. Yeah. Now, people come up and I'm going to go, Lord, I pray for my brother. And the guy's going to go, he doesn't remember my name. But uh, <laughs> revealed one of my big secrets in the ministry. <laughs> but I, you know, it was, you know, pretty... Just, you know, hanging out with Danny, you know, it was, uh, what, he would just call me, hey, I'm preaching over at this place tonight, it's uh, near your house, come over. And I would just go over and then sit in the back and listen to Danny. And then he'd call me up front to pray for people. And I'm, <laughs> I'm like six months old in the Lord, I don't know what's going on here. But uh, uh, that's, that's discipleship, that's primarily how discipleship uh, takes place. When, uh, when we first brought David Hawking over a number of years ago to... Uh, I don't know, do a men's retreat or something. I, I met him very briefly at a pastor's conference, and he had just become associated with Calvary Chapels and never been uh, really to Hawaii to do ministry before. So he said, hey, uh, as long as I'm there, I'm going to be there for a couple weeks. So just, uh, hey, call around some of the churches and, you know, you know give me some books some other teaching times. And his little uh, slogan is, have Bible, we'll travel. And uh, you know, how often do you want to teach? As much as you can get, you know, okay, you know, so I, I did that. Of course, once he did our men's retreat, did our Sunday morning, uh, then uh, he and Carol, his wife, were in the islands for another 10 days or so. So basically, I went with him uh, to all of his other speaking engagements uh, and, uh, and stood in the back at, at the book table and sold his books for him. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, the two of them and Kathy and I would go out and eat somewhere uh, afterwards and everything. And it was great because I could sit there and ask him about his messages and who said what and why and why this and instead of that way and uh, it was just it was just that opportunity walk with the wise and uh, you'll become 
wise. And um, uh, it was, that's discipleship. I mean, I kind of shoved my way into the door there to, uh, to get it done. And, and then he would thank me later. Uh, no, I think it's the other way around. But uh, uh, that's Paul's way. Uh, disciple the few uh, to reach the many. Uh, one little textual thing, just a note for uh, Bible students, verse 6. Uh, notice uh, we have a pronoun change, but we sailed from Philippi. Dr. Luke joins him once again. You didn't even know he was missing, did you? Yeah, he got left at Philippi. Again, when we uh, did our little background and overview in the book, we talked about uh, Luke being the first uh, medical missionary. He was a doctor. Uh, Paul describes him not just as a doctor. He describes him as a fellow or label, laborer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Luke was out there preaching, teaching, uh, just like Timothy, Titus, uh, or anybody else. He's been left in Philippi. He's been ministering, pastoring that church uh, for quite some time. But now he joins up with Paul again. And, of course, Luke will remain with him uh, until uh, his life is taken uh, there uh, in Rome. But uh, uh, it must have been great for Paul to rejoice, to have Luke, to have Titus, to have Timothy uh, with him once again, along with these other men that he's uh, discipled. Uh, they're waiting for a ship uh, to depart, and when it, uh, when it shows up, uh, they head back to, uh, to Troas. So Paul begins his journey. The purpose is to strengthen the believers, to disciple the few, to reach the many. That's the way Paul built the kingdom of God. Uh, now in Troas, he has an opportunity, and this is where the long sermon comes in. Secondly, Paul's lengthy sermon brought a miraculous result. That's in verse 7 to 12. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, and in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, Embracing him said, do not trouble yourselves for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive uh, and they were not a little comforted. And of course, uh, many uh, pastor preacher types use this as a, as a text to uh, substantiate very long sermons. But uh, uh, I think uh, actually preaching too long was a problem. Uh, a guy ended up dying as a, as a result. But uh, uh, fortunately, his, uh, his name, Eutychus, means fortunate. And he was fortunate that the apostle Paul uh, was there. Now, whether you're measuring this on Jewish uh, uh, time or Roman time determines, did this happen on a Saturday night or, or did this happen uh, on a Sunday night? Uh, textual evidence would say it's on Roman's time, so it's a Sunday night. Uh, again, this seems to be a shift from the church meeting on the Shabbat or on Saturday to actually on Sunday, the first day of the week. <laughs> uh, a couple of reasons why that was probably done. Uh, it's referred to as the Lord's Day in Revelation 1. Sunday, the church is born on Sunday on the day of Pentecost, one of the few Jewish feasts that actually takes place on a Sunday. Again, Jesus uh, again, is the, the first fruits risen from the dead, first of month among many that would come. And of course, the Holy Spirit is poured out on that day. Uh, thirdly, by raising himself from the dead on a Sunday, on that Sunday during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he fulfills uh, another Jewish feast, the Feast of First Fruits. Jesus is the first fruits of, uh, of many to come. So uh, when somebody asks, uh, why does your church meet on a Sunday rather than on another day of the week? Well, it's the traditional day the church is worshipped on. Uh, we do it not because of a Catholic edict, some given sometime in the 5th century. We do it because of fulfillment, fulfillment of a Jewish feast. A lot of confusion on this issue, but this is the traditional time. This is the shift that is taking place. We have one other reference in the New Testament to the church meeting on the first day of the week. Uh, in the evening, well, it was practical. Uh, they didn't get the day off. <laughs> Everybody still, still worked uh, on that particular day. And sometimes when people meet, it's just uh, all about, you know, it's practical. When can they get together? The Calvary Chapel that's in uh, Honoka meets at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a, on a Sunday. It's not out of tradition. It's just practical when the first 
church first started over there, they, uh, uh, they had so many guys that uh, worked in the uh, tourist industry and in the hotels uh, there uh, in North Kona uh, that worked early on Sunday mornings. Church is just a handful of people in Doug and Elizabeth Glenn's home. And so in order for the guys to be able to be there, they just waited till they got off work, met at cl- four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and then they would just kind of eat together because everybody drove a long ways to, uh, to get there and stuff. It's interesting. It's, it's probably 10 years later, and they're still meeting at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm not sure if they know why anymore. But that was the original reason. But uh, uh, they meet uh, for a very practical reason later uh, in the day. Uh, the church shifting from, uh, again, from the Shabbat to a Sunday is kind of a, a natural occurrence because we're, well, Paul says, Very clear, we're not under the Mosaic Law. Uh, If you think about the Ten Commandments, they're all reiterated again in the New Testament, except for one, uh, keeping the Shabbat or the Sabbath, because that was the sign of the covenant of the Mosaic uh, relationship that uh, God had with his people, Israel. Our sign of the covenant is uh, the Lord's table, uh, the broken matzah, the bread and the cup. That's the sign of the new covenant. Therefore, uh, it seems to be a natural thing, a progression they began to be on the Lord's day of the first day of the week. Paul says in Romans uh, 14.5 about this idea of which day to, to worship on. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day uh, to the Lord, he does not observe it. Let everybody kind of figure it out. Uh, technically, since this is Roman time, uh, it's on a Sunday night. Uh, to Jewish people, that would be Monday. So maybe the church should have been meeting on Mondays all, all these years. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Paul says, hey, actually, uh, uh, any day is good for me. Uh, but everybody kind of figure it out in your own mind, kind of what, uh, what works out for you. If the only time that we could get a facility uh, would be on a Saturday night, we'd do Saturday night. I don't know if Monday night would work, uh, but, uh, you know, we just have to, you have to kind of, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be broken. Uh, we, uh, so to some people, it's, it's a big deal. I understand, uh, you know, I understand uh, people that are, that are Jewish, that are uh, brought up uh, worshiping always on, on a Saturday, on the, on the Sabbath. When they come to faith in Christ, they kind of still want to, uh, meet on that day. A number of years ago when I was uh, at uh, Carrie's dad's uh, congregation there in Waikiki, I was, uh, uh, did the teaching and then afterwards uh, uh, they would always, uh, the, what is described here, they would kind of have the Lord's communion and go right into uh, basically a, a potluck together. I was talking to uh, a young gal that was from uh, Russia uh, and she had come to faith in Jesus, Yeshua as the Hamashiach, as her Messiah. She was excited about that, but she couldn't find any kind of Messianic congregation, so she went to a Seventh-day Adventist church. I go, wow, so uh, how would you end up there? Well, I didn't really believe what they believed, but at least they had the right day, because they meet on Saturday, if you didn't know. Uh, and in her mind, that was, that was the day you got together to worship the Lord. That, she was convinced in her own mind. Uh, and that's what Paul says here. Let each person be convinced uh, in his own mind. Uh, the bigger issue is to not forsake meeting together, to make sure we are worshiping together. Again, Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 25 says, not forsaking the assemblies of ourselves together, as some are in the habit of doing or in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Uh, I believe it's the Apostle Paul writing here says that uh, uh, there is going to be a tendency, as you see, the day. What day? The day of the Lord's return. As we get closer and closer to the day of the Lord's return, there's going to be, some would fall into a habit. Uh, that, that's what it means by a manner of some. NIV is a habit, a habit of actually not getting together on a regular basis with other believers. Uh, those are the days that we live in now. And it's become such a problem uh, is that the church has actually changed uh, the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to worship God. Uh, and, uh, and we do that through, through our singing, through our study of God's word and, and so forth. Uh, the byproduct of the church worshiping God is evangelism. Uh, sometimes we get the cart before the horse. But there's a lot of churches that uh, the purpose of the church is to try to get people to come to the church uh, through entertainment. 
So rather than, than us sing, we'll sing to you and entertain you and so forth. Uh, we'll customize our messages uh, shorter and briefer and shallower because people don't have a lot of Bible knowledge. So we're going to, uh, we don't want them to have to decode a lot. So uh, we'll make the church look like a movie theater and then we'll customize it for, uh, for them. That's because people are in, they've become in the habit of not actually getting together to worship. I understand why they do that, why they've come uh, to that point. Uh, but I think it's more important to hold to the scriptures uh, and minister and disciple the few to reach the many, uh, to bring people into the full knowledge of the counsel of God, because as we go to that day, there's a tendency to forsake. And, uh, and I see it. <clears throat> when Kathy and I got saved, basically we went to everything. We were both self-employed. We didn't have time. Uh, I had a mortgage, we had a mortgage and we had a brand new baby. It didn't matter. We were so excited uh, about being saved and so excited that uh, God could speak to us through his word, that the Bible was God's word. Uh, we just thought that there can't be anything more important in life than learning what this book says. There was no internet. We couldn't go online. There was no MP3. They had these funny little things called a cassette. You can Google it later and see one. Uh, if you like it, I have a lot I'll sell you very cheap. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was just hard to come by. Uh, there was one Christian radio station, uh, and you would turn it on at 8.30 and then turn it off. And then you'd turn it on at 10.30 and then turn it off because there was a lot of bad with a lot of good. And we didn't know a lot, but it was easy to tell the ones that <laughs> were not good. It's like, I don't think that's in the Bible. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, but there were some good guys on there. But, man, uh, you just kind of had to, we went wherever we could go. Uh, and I, I don't see that, and that's a commonality across, across the country uh, as well. Uh, it's really changed. It doesn't really matter the day. Let each one be convinced in his own mind. But we're not to forsake the assembly together. Uh, these guys were working all day. Half the congregation or more, maybe three quarters of it, were slaves. They probably put in a little bit tougher day than you or I. Uh, but when the op opportunity came to hear the Apostle Paul, uh, they were there. Uh, it's, uh, secondly, it's in an upper room, and you can actually figure out, if you're a Bible detective, uh, who owned the home, because when Paul writes, uh, again, from the, the Mamertine prison there in Rome, awaiting uh, his death, he writes to Timothy and tells him, hey, I forgot something in Troas, this place, some guy's house there, my cloak, go to his house and get it, and uh, so he actually uh, identifies to Timothy uh, the home, this three-story home uh, that uh, they are gathered in. And I'm sure they had uh, a big crowd uh, because the Apostle Paul uh, was, uh, was there. Uh, Ricky Ryan has a church there in West Maui. And, you know, once in a while, his good friend, Greg Laurie, comes and does a Sunday morning. It's a little bigger crowd on those, uh, on those Sunday mornings. And uh, this probably was here as well. Uh, Paul's sermon, again, was uh, preceded by the breaking of the bread. Notice that, it's the first day of the week. Uh, it's the purpose of their meeting. Look at verse seven again. And when the disciples came together to break bread, the disciples did not come together necessarily to hear Paul preach, they did. But their purpose for coming together on the first day of the week was to break bread. That means communion. Uh, that means uh, taking the unleavened bread and breaking it and remembering the Lord's Supper. Now, he'll use a different set of words and a different phrase later. They did eat together later, uh, but this is very specific. They got together on the first day of the week basically to have communion and remember the Lord's table and to remember what uh, Christ had done for them, to remember the sacrifice on the cross, to remember that their sins had been uh, forgiven, to remember that they'll one day be in heaven with him celebrating the Lord's uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. That's kind of what kept these guys going. That was the main purpose of them uh, coming together. Sometimes we assume, again, the main purpose was because the Apostle Paul uh, was there. That was, according to the Greek text, that's not the main reason that they came together. Paul, of course, uh, did give a sermon. Now, I'm going to give him a little grace and say he actually gave them a seminar. So if you say he gave a sermon that lasted like two or three hours, that's like, oh, brother. But if you say he gave a seminar that lasted three hours, it's like, oh, I can do that. <laughs> how many people went to How to Walk? Oh, man, you guys were in 
listening to sermons and teaching from 9 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon. That's a lot shorter than this period of time. Again, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's spring. Uh, you know, probably sun goes down 8, 8, 30. By the time they get going, it's 9. He goes to mid. That's only like a three-hour seminar. That's, that's not bad. But uh, uh, still, uh, we'll find that it was uh, uh, very difficult for one young man to, uh, to stay awake through the, through the whole time. Uh, some people ask, so they met the first day of the week. I got that. They had communion when they did. Does that mean we're supposed to have communion every time we meet? Some, some churches do, uh, based on this verse. It doesn't say that. It just says this time on the first day of the week, they, they broke bread and they have communion. It doesn't say, and they did this every time they, they met. But some people uh, assume that. But uh, you don't have to wait for the first day of the week. You don't have to wait for me. You don't have to be in a particular place. All you've got to do is have some unleavened bread and uh, have the grape juice and uh, be with believers and, uh, and pray. And, and uh, I've seen uh, and experienced some pretty creative substitutions for, for those uh, uh, elements as, uh, as well, like surfers on the North Shore using Coca-Cola for the communion before they paddle out on a, on a big day. I don't blame them, though. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, his, uh, again, his sermon became a seminar. He kept talking till midnight, uh, many lamps in the upstairs. And um, uh, again, those lamps uh, would be torches, <laughs> torches that were burning. I don't think they were tiki, but I think or the, <laughs> that word lamp means torches. One writer said, we can easily imagine a stuffy, oppressive atmosphere in the third story chamber, the Mediterranean heat, the grimy press of the weary crowd just returned from work. The smoke from the torches, the lack of oxygen, all made for drowsiness. And, uh, but uh, Paul keeps on going. And it doesn't finish. I mean, even after he comes back up from uh, uh, healing uh, Eutychus, uh, they keep going. A time of discussion, a time of eating, they stay until the sun comes up. Uh, we might call this the uh, first How to Walk. How to Walk Conference 57. Not in Chevy. This is like 57 as in A.D. is about the time of this uh, little Bible conference at Troas. And then Paul's sermon led to him raising the dead. Verse 9, and in a window sat a young man, the term young is a particular Greek word that so we can kind of peg, peg Eutychus to be anywhere from 8 to 14, a potency to, for him not to be, uh, uh, to probably be a young teenager. Uh, named Eutychus, I mentioned his name means fortunate, uh, who was sinking uh, into a deep sleep. The word sleep uh, is where we get our English word uh, hypnotic. Uh, sinking means it was very gradual. It, it, I don't know if you've ever, of course you've experienced that. You're trying not to go to sleep, but it just kind of keeps uh, coming on you. Somewhere else, not, not here of course, but it was, it was somewhere else. Uh, he was overcome by sleep and Paul was uh, continued speaking. He fell down from the third story and was uh, taken up dead. Uh, some people say, well, uh, how do you know he was really dead? The attending <coughs> physician said that he was dead, Dr. Luke. So he was dead. And uh, Paul goes down. It's interesting. He, um, he, he, I don't know if he was thinking of Elijah or Elisha, who both, uh, uh, again, raised the dead in a similar manner where they just put their body over them and embraced them and their uh, breath came back into him, whether he was thinking of those episodes of... Uh, those uh, Old Testament prophets or, or not, that's, that's exactly what, uh, what he did here. Uh, and I think there's a reason uh, this uh, is uh, recorded in Scripture other than to simply embarrass Eutychus for all eternity. Probably meet him in heaven. Hey, nice to meet you. What's your name? Eutychus. Oh, man, you're that guy. Yeah, yeah, that's me. You know, there's some things you don't want to be famous for. I think the real reason, other than to embarrass Eutychus in heaven for all eternity, uh, is uh, to show or to establish or to authenticate the apostleship of, the, of Paul. You know, we mentioned the, uh, the letter he has just written to the church at Rome, which basically lays out, we call it the constitution of our faith. Uh, it, uh, it lays out all the major doctrines uh, of, uh, of the Bible pertaining to salvation, uh, and, uh, and, and in including the future uh, uh, of Israel. Uh, if we think about uh, all the letters that he has written to the other churches, they, they make up the bulk of our theology today. 
And I think it's included here by Dr. Luke for the reason to authenticate, yes, it's true that Paul, Paul was not one of the original 12, uh, but Paul was the real deal in terms of an apostle. In other words, apostle just means sent forth. So every mis missionary that goes out is an apostle, literally. We call them B apostles as opposed to the A apostles, the A team. Uh, and uh, even though, again, Paul was not one of the originals, uh, he says that Jesus showed up and literally spoke to him. And that's how he knew what he knew. He says it over in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, where he says, But I, I made known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revel revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul says, Nobody taught me this. Nobody spoke this to me. Jesus Christ showed up, and he told me audibly, verbally, the gospel of Jesus Christ and everything I know about the gospel of grace. It's a pretty big claim. How do you authenticate that? I raised the dead. Uh, so I, I think that's the main reason, uh, and a very good reason, why uh, Dr. Luke includes this particular episode, not to just embarrass Eutychus for all time and eternity, but to authenticate his apostleship. And then everything is concluded with a potluck, verse 11. Uh, now when he had uh, come up, uh, had broken bread and eaten. So that's a whole different terminology in a Greek. It just means eating and uh, uh, talked a long while. And that means a discussion, you know, back and forth, questions, answers, and so forth. Until daybreak, uh, he departed. So uh, again, a real distinction between the two. Uh, it is the first day of the week that they're meeting. And, uh, and there's a lot of evidence that indicates uh, this is a shift from meeting on the Shabbat originally, uh, and now it's moved over to the Lord's Day or the first day of the week. Uh, they do break bread in terms of communion, whether they did that every time and every time they met, uh, we, uh, we don't know. Uh, there's certainly no, uh, no limitation to doing that, nor is there a, a directive that you have to do it every time we get together uh, as believers. And of course, then they finish the meal uh, together, which would be important because in that culture, uh, eating together was everything. It's true in a lot of cultures uh, around, uh, around the world today. And, uh, 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 you know, just even in your own home, if, you, if, you, if you're, you're meeting somebody uh, for, the, you know, for the first time and they come to your, your home and they eat, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of uh, appreciate it if, if they like the food that you put before them. I don't eat that. You know, it's like, well, God bless you. You know, I mean, I just, I don't know what you do with that. We're going to have be have a close friendship here, I can tell. Uh, Jesus, in talking about the importance of a relationship with believers, said this in uh, Revelation 23:20. Uh, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. I mean, again, it's, it's a Jewish thing. It's a it's an Eastern thing. Uh, it's important. It talks about fellowship. There's all the food. Uh, uh, we're going to break it apart. We're going to eat it together. You're going to have the same nutrients as I have. They're all going in us together. We're sharing this together. We're becoming one as we do this. Uh, and that's the idea of the early church. Uh, add that to the factor, an incredibly diverse group of people that would never normally uh, give each other time of day. Half of this church, maybe three quarters, were slaves. You also had Roman officials. We, at least we've seen several of those on that occasion. You've got Jewish people. You've got Gentiles all blended together. You've got the church in Antioch, and there's people there from North Africa, uh, from the Mediterranean, uh, from the Middle East, all together uh, in one church. You just did not find this. They had to come up with a name for church. There was no name for church. So they, they had to come up with uh, the word, the called out once. That's the same term, uh, ecclesia, that is used for the riot in Ephesus. The riot in Ephesus, that crowd gathered there, that was ecclesia. That's a bunch of people getting together for some crazy wild reason. Uh, but they are, they are distinctive because of their purpose and why they're together. There was no name church. They had to come up with a name because it had never been seen before. Because of the diversity of what was happening. We, can, we, we if you live in Hawaii, can relate to this. You can understand this. It's kind of normal here. Guess what? It is not normal <laughs> in other places around the world. And, uh, and one, one, of the, one of the cool things, you know, of course, is to, uh, you know, is to take people on trips into another culture 
and then they have appreciation for their own. Because right now, the culture you're in, you grow up in, it's just all you know. Uh, and it's just not like that everywhere. We're, we're closer to this church uh, than, than most of the people on the planet uh, in terms of what they had uh, in their relationship with, uh, with each other. Uh, and they have this meal together. And uh, according to church history, that really was very typical uh, in their getting together. A couple things as we close here. Uh, and that is, uh, I want to ask the question if anyone's falling asleep. <laughs> if people are, are sleeping in the service, this is an awesome message to give here because nobody's going to dare go to sleep. <laughs> but people can fall asleep spiritually. Uh, and they do it all the time. Some people are more excited about a garage sale than they are coming to church. Some people are a lot more excited about a particular football team or what's going on on television than they are uh, in coming to, to church. And there's lots of people sitting in churches that are they're just spiritually asleep uh, this morning. And C.S. Lewis in his uh, classic novel, Screw Tape Letters, Screw Tape is the kind of one of the senior devils. Uh, and uh, tongue in cheek and for the purpose of a parable uh, in the novel uh, C.S. Lewis uh, allows us into conversations that these uh, demonic entities are having with one another and how they might entrap human beings and keep them from, from uh, coming to the gospel and serving Christ uh, and the senior devil says to his trainee Wormwood quote the safest road to hell is the gradual one the gentle slope soft underfoot without sudden turnings Without milestones, without signposts, it's just that gradual going to sleep. I think that concept, uh, I don't know, this is my opinion, I think that concept uh, of C.S. Lewis expressing that may have come from Hebrews chapter 2, 1, where it says, therefore we must give the more earnest, or earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Uh, again, one of the uh, many warnings in that particular epistle and the drifting away is a nautical term. It's describing a ship that's in anchor. Uh, the anchor comes loose. Uh, the ship begins to drift, and then it crashes upon, uh, upon the rocks. It is unintentional. Nobody thinks, I'm going to park my ship out there today, kind of hoping anchor will come loose. That baby will smash right into the rocks. That's what I'm hoping. Nobody thinks that. They're, they, they're shocked. They're shocked when it, when it, when it happens. When we uh, still used to uh, do some uh, men's kayak trips uh, on the north shore of Molokai, uh, our uh, second night in, we would stay in Pelicuna Bay. Uh, and uh, big horseshoe bay, beautiful white sandy beach, a river coming down uh, out, of the, out of the valley, very, uh, very picturesque. And, uh, and then the next uh, night, we'd, we'd paddle around the point uh, and stay at uh, a family's home that's uh, uh, built up on the side of the cliff there. Uh, and they would tell us that uh, uh, every, uh, every year uh, people would come to them uh, who had been uh, camping and gone ashore next door in boats. They'd pull in, beautiful harbor, uh, just picturesque, uh, lay anchor, uh, and then go in to get fresh water or uh, hike in the valley or whatever. And then they'd come back and their boat would be gone and they would hike over the cliff because they had a shortwave radio and they could report their, their boat stolen. And he says, boy, we always hated to tell them, nobody stole your boat, it's at the bottom of the ocean. Oh. Because that, most of that bay is all sand. Your anchor didn't stick on anything. And boats went down all the time, every year. Nobody did that on purpose. Nobody did it on purpose. They came back out to shore and they were shocked. And there's a lot of people like that, spiritually. Uh, they don't know what happened. It was a slow drift, it was unintentional. What also causes, causes people to fall asleep spiritually is sin, <coughs> compromising, uh, just never repenting of, of small sins. Jesus says it's this small foxes that ruin the vineyards. And Samson is kind of the preeminent example uh, of this in, uh, in Scripture, who begins his life in faith, he ends his life in faith, and everything in between is pretty messed up. Uh, and, uh, and of course, he literally did physically go to sleep his final doze on Delilah's lap was symbolic of his whole spiritual state. Uh, listen to his own commentary, or at least the commentary of the writer here in Judges, in Judges 6, 20, uh, 16, 20. This is Samson. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. He didn't know. He just, 
He thought he was good to go. He made a little compromises. Uh, don't touch anything dead, part of the Nazarite vow. Well, yeah, he did that. He grabbed the jawbone of a, a donkey. That's dead. You're not supposed to do that. You know, no, 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 no light. Don't even touch a grape or a raisin. Well, no, he does that too. Uh, no immediate judgment. No uh, immediate intervention by God because of the compromises of his life. He didn't even know when the Lord left him. The third reason it happens is familiarity. And uh, uh, just to illustrate it uh, uh, this way. It's like the uh, train conductor uh, in an in older train station where they would have to announce all the destinations. They sell the tickets to the cities. They announce the cities over and over every day. This train now leaving for this train. They do it so long, they think they've been there. They've said those cities. They've described those cities. They've described the destination. They've helped so many people. They've called it out so many times. They think they've been there. They've never been there. They just have a familiarity. It's possible for people to come in every Sunday or when they can, uh, hear the gospel, hear the word of God, and be familiar with it and never make a commitment to it. How do we stay awake in church? Ken Hughes says this, and I like it. When we sing a hymn, we should shout out everything else and sing it to God. Uh, you, I just say amen. We, we have to work at that. That's not an easy thing. I mean, <laughs> you know, you come in, you sit down, and it's like <clears throat> there's still all the stuff of the week going on and, uh, uh, and, and everything. Uh, and uh, I, I would suggest trying to prepare your heart uh, early. I, I think that the Jewish model was a good one. If you, th if you think of it all beginning the, the night before, if you start getting ready the night before, I am your shirt the night before. If you start getting ready the night before, if you think about you know, uh, you know, getting those kids ready and, so that you can actually get here, shocking statement, a little early, a little early, uh, and uh, so that you can get in here and prepare your own heart and mind. Because it's a battle. It's a battle to, to, when we're singing, to not have it be just Christian karaoke, uh, but to actually sing to God. Singing not only with the mouth, but with the heart uh, and mind. As others lead us in prayer, we should pray along with them. A spiritual concert. When we hear the scriptures, uh, we must listen, for we're hearing the voice of God. We must listen to God's word as we would a love letter, for that is what the Bible is, end quote. And, uh, yeah, I just uh, I, I think of the story of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, we know him, of course, uh, 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 being martyred for his faith, you know, right before the uh, Nazi regime uh, fell and so, and so forth. One of the few pastors in Germany that took a stand against Hitler, uh, Nazism during uh, World War II. And um, <coughs> he, uh, at one time, of course, was a seminary professor. And, uh, and he, in one of his books, makes reference to the fact that, that uh, he was uh, convicted by God because he would listen to these young guys in their sermons. They'd be taking homiletics, and then they'd have to get up there and give their 20-minute sermon or whatever it was. Uh, and he said the temptation, and of course, these guys are just starting out, so some are a lot better than others. Uh, and he said the temptation was to sit in the back and grade papers uh, or fill out a grade sheet on them or so forth. And he got convicted because he realized that's the word of God that's being read. That's the word of God that's being expressed. And as a believer, I've got to be able to put down my pen and listen and hear from God every time it's being taught. It doesn't matter who it is or what the occasion is. So says Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, I was very uh, impressed by that. Uh, Luther had a, a dream, uh, a, a sense of parable that he actually wrote down. Again, one of these ideas where uh, it's an image or a parable of, uh, of Satan uh, and, uh, and again discussing with those trying to trip Christians up uh, and in it Luther writes one spirit said there was a company of Christians crossing the desert I loosed the lions on them and soon the sands of the desert were strewn with their mangled bodies what of that answered Satan the lions destroyed their bodies but their souls were saved uh, it is a soul that I'm after uh, another reported there's a company of Christians uh, Pilgrim sailing through the sea on a vessel, and I sent a great wind against the ship that drove the ship on the rocks, and every Christian aboard the ship was drowned. What of that, said Satan. Their bodies were drowned in the sea, but their souls were saved. It is a soul that I am after. A third came forward to give his report. He said, for 10 years, I've been trying to cast a Christian into a deep sleep. 
And at last I have, I have succeeded. And within the corridors of hell ring a shout of triumph. That's Satan. That's what he wants to do. And just get us to fall asleep. And it's like Eutychus. <laughs> it's like this being hypnotized. It's very gradual. Uh, it's not all of a sudden. Uh, and we need to wake up. That's what Paul says to the Corinthians. Awake to righteousness and sin not. <laughs> to the Ephesians, he says, wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Jams together.